So you probably know about us, but you might not know everything about us. Um, so one thing is we do produce compost at three of the uh, three sites in Massachusetts. And I think we make a very high quality mm -hmm. compost. We've come a long way in the last 13 years, just adding different layers of uh, testing and quality control and improving our sites and improving the um, people who are running the sites. And I think we have a really strong team now. And, <clears throat> you know, long term, our goal in Massachusetts is to collect the food scraps, turn them into a compost product, and then get them back out to growing uh, new food. And whether that's at your garden at home or out in farms in central mass, or, you know, if we're lucky enough to have a farm within 495 or 128, then usually they're a small vegetable farm that's using our compost. Um, so that's our end goal because in the food scraps are nutrients and those nutrients are going to get wasted if we don't uh, if we don't rescue them in your green bin and uh, turn them into finished compost. It's just need to hang out with Norm. I'm sorry, Levon. Norm. I wish I could, Levon. I gotta talk with the people right now. <laughs> Can you go upstairs and talk with mom? Oh. Yeah. Here's my son. He wants to hang out. He was part of my technical difficulties. Okay. So, um, we have a short webinar here, uh, a short presentation in the webinar, and we'll we'll stay here till eight. And I'm happy to answer you guys questions. Um, so, huh? yep, our mission at core is rescue the nutrients and turn them back into uh, new food. And it's important to realize that not all composts are the same. You know, composting is just a process and you can take anything and compost it and what you have out the back end is not gonna be the, uh, all the same. Like compost isn't all the same. So my example is if you make a compost out of grass, you're gonna um, have whatever was in grass and what's not in grass. So herbicides, pesticides, for example, and um, what you might be lacking are nutrients, like what you can get in food. So food strap composts are nice because they contain the whole range of nutrients that food needs. So when you compost a tomato, it has just about everything that a new tomato plant needs. Whereas if you're making, if you're using grass <laughs> compost to grow tomatoes, well, the grass didn't have everything because it's grass. And, you know, grass isn't like the epitome of, you know, it's not grown in like the healthiest soil. It's coming off your lawn and we're not all farmers and a lot of people don't really treat their grass well anyways. So grass doesn't really have a great nutrient profile. Um, and the other thing is like in the processing of the compost, like in a food strap compost that we produce, we're getting it up to temperature. We're keeping it aerobic. Um, temperature to get pathogen kill, weed seed kill, and then we're curing it for three to six months and then screening it. So you could have a food scrap compost that didn't reach temperature and so has weed seeds in it. So even among the food scrap composts, they're not all the same either. So, you know, over the last 13 years, we've strove to make the best product we can by improving our, um, you know, our processes. And 
you know, our sites and our testing on the back end. And, you know, all of that, our ability to do that really comes from you guys being part of the collection surface, collection service, because that, that uh, service like funds what we do and enables us to like run good sites. Um, so Black Earth Compost is really unique in that we're vertically integrated. We did the collection and the compost and, and that really does lead to, uh, you know, a great service on the front end and a great product on the back end. And long term, we're trying to gear that product to be able to, you know, not only go to gardeners, but also go to farms. And I'm going to start the presentation, but near the end, we talk about our um, uh, FarmWorks program that actually gets compost to farms at a subsidized rate. Um, so just off the bat, does anyone have any uh, quick questions? Or things they want to hear about? Oh, I see someone typing. Who typing? The temperature needed to kill weed seeds. Who? So the temperature to kill pathogens. Who do you see typing? Um, it was this person here. She was typing. Why to typing? So the temperature to kill weed seeds is i'm sorry the temperature to kill pathogens is 131 degrees for three days that's in like an in vessel system um and that temperature you know that's for like e coli salmonella uh etc and reaching that temperature seems to be sufficient for killing weed seeds also so weed seeds might be killed at a lower temperature but um 131 seems to work in in addition just like the long time within the rotting humid environment re really kills seeds too because it, it's a lot of seeds aren't really ready for that situation so um like think of your seeds that you get from like you know johnny's or in a seed packet like you wouldn't store them in like you know a, a like wet environment um that you know they wouldn't really last especially like real vulnerable seeds like vegetables um i think there is one other question Why? yes the um it, it does kill uh jumping worms as well here hold on one second All right, I'll admit, I thought the webinar was at 7.30, and that's why I'm a little unprepared. But uh, we had a plan to uh, occupy my son. Anyways, um, yes, jumping worms are a big concern, and the compost definitely kills them. Also, the environment's not really great for them. The challenge is preventing from them from being reintroduced um like in the later stages of composting and so we've taken a lot of steps to like prevent that reintroduction and our new site in manchester is really good because when the finished compost comes out of the building it goes up a conveyor up onto the landfill and there's a gravel pad up there that is absolutely not livable by a worm like compacted gravel is not where they can live so I'm excited about that. 
Um, and yeah, jumping worms, it's something new that's come on the scene. I'd be careful about municipal yard compost because they're definitely not hitting temperatures. And most of them, most municipal yard sites are not going to hit your temperatures and not like prevent reintroduction. Um, someone asked about leaf mulch. So that's a product that it's basically just leaves that are broken down and hit some temperatures. And, but they're not too broken down. But the nice thing about it is it's like a, it gets eaten through the season by bugs and worms and it breaks down and then that organic matter is going to feed the soil rather than like wood mulch that, you know, if you don't remove every year, then it's going to like the wood kind of builds up in the soil and it can be like a nitrogen draw. Um, and the last quick question is best method. What's the best method to incorporate compost into a grass yard? that will be turned into various garden spaces. Uh, I'll say on the first part, best way to put compost into a yard is a spring rake. That's like your basic leaf rake that you'd use in the fall, even though it's called a spring rake. I think the spring refers to like the action of the tines. They're kind of like, like the metal tines. Um, I think that's good because, so I like to take a wheelbarrow, um, dump a small pile in the lawn, you know, every five feet or so, just a small pile, like a little bit. And then you take a spring rake and, and you rake it out in every direction. And it's nice because it pulls the, um, the compost in between the, the grass blades. And like, you'll see the compost on the surface initially and that's fine if you give it if you l let it like rain in like wait for two rainstorms eventually the grass blades will come up in between the compost and you're not going to see the compost anymore because you know some people don't like seeing stuff that's not grass um and then turning grass yard into a garden space i'll kind of leave that up to the internet but what we've done here at our house is we uh kind of shovel up the sod and flip it over and leave it like that for a month or so to mostly kill the grass and then you could try tilling it after that um just to break up the roots and last one someone asked and i'll i'll say you could probably go online and find more answers to how you can um turn a grass yard into a garden space um but so if you were going to use compost i would probably do your grass kill first and then add the compost when you're doing like a tillage step um and then can compost work as a weed preventer Yes, I mean, you can put enough compost down to smother weeds. Um, is that an excessive use of compost? Probably. You know, like you don't really need two inches. Could you do it? Yeah. Um, but I, I would think like a leaf mulch would be better. And you could put a little bit of compost down first and then leaf mulch on top. Or, um, I don't know, put the compost down and then pull the weeds. So like that would be an, a way you can do it is kind of from a permaculture standpoint where you're trying not to disturb the seed bank in the soil. So you can put compost down, do your plantings, and then do a like weed by hand. And then the next year kind of do the same thing. And in theory, there should be less weed seeds um because you're not redisturbing the seed bank 
in the soil, you know, by like tilling or something like that. Um, and one more, someone's asked if you can use compost in the yard for overseeding. And yes, you can. I would seed first and then put compost down. Maybe put a little thicker than you would for um, like feeding uh, the lawn or the trees, because then the compost can kind of act as a uh, like a mulch cover a little bit. But really, for seeding, like your most important thing is like once that grass seed sprouts and it's like this big to that big, the most important thing is just don't let it dry out. So just keep it watered. And yeah, you can put hay on top. Um, but anywhere that the hay isn't fully covering, you're not going to get like uh, good sprouting because it's just going to dry out. So like sprinkler is good or that's why they say, you know, do grass seed in the spring or the fall. I'd say like getting into May or June, that's kind of too late to be doing grass seed. Even now, like you probably should have spread late March. Um, all right, so I'm just going to jump into the presentation. Uh, and this is kind of talking about a lot of things that we do. And so I won't spend a ton of time. I guess I got to share my screen, don't I? Okay. So I'm going to share first and then, so you might learn some new things that we do. Um, you'll, you'll learn some new things. I bet you don't know everything we do. All right. Hey, look at that. There I am. So uh, this is our house. Um, and this right here is a picture of a half yard of compost. So we just like built these conveyor trucks, which we think is kind of revolutionary, but we're able to like back up to your house, unload a small amount, like just a half cubic yard and then drive away. And there's no dumping, so we don't have to worry about overhead wires or anything like that. And it's nice because not everyone needs like three cubic yards, four, five, which like our minimum used to be like two or three in some areas of the state. But now we can just deliver a half yard, which is about five of these wheelbarrows. And I think that's a great amount for just like top dressing around uh, your property. So feeding your trees here in the back, you know, top dressing on your garden and, you know, then for your vegetable garden, putting some on and incorporating in. So that's why we kind of came up with this. And this right here is your half yard. Um, yeah, so our compost, sustainably sourced. So it comes from food scraps. Food scraps are a plentiful resource and it's they're rich in nutrients and it's really a shame that they get wasted so you know the the future is re like tapping into these resources and you know nitrogen phosphorus potassium that's what we're getting at like that's what's in the food straps that's what plants need um and if you're not getting them from food straps then you're probably getting them from uh a fertilizer company like and th they mine them out of rock you know phosphorus a lot of it comes from africa a small part comes from florida we have some mines potassium a lot comes from canada russia was like one of the largest suppliers to the world of potassium uh you know until uh, a couple of years ago and then you know nitrogen that's mined out of the atmosphere and they actually use, um, so they use natural gas, you know, which is mined out of the ground. They pull the hydrogens off natural gas and they put it onto the nitrogen in the atmosphere. So 
that's really like a fossil fuel based fertilizer and when they talk about like fossil fuel based fertilizers that's what they're talking about it's like yeah anyways food scraps it's a source that's here you know we're tapping into it now that's the easy one um you know in 50 years we'll be tapping into like other organic waste that we produce and like none of it's gonna be wasted so that's the direction we're going and if we're not we're kind of screwed as a society in my opinion uh compost so we're sustainably sourced it improves soil structure uh it's one of the few so with food waste you could turn it into you know you could send it to an anaerobic digester and turn it into natural gas for burning and what you get out the back is called digestate and that actually you've it doesn't improve soil organic matter because you stripped out the carbons um and burned them whereas with composting you're actually like putting that carbon into the soil and it's shown to improve soil organic matter um you know putting carbon into agricultural fields is probably one of the few realistic solutions to climate change in my opinion um someone can ask me about that more later and uh we test our compost like i've been saying uh salts nutrients heavy metals herbicides we test that with plant trials in-house um we've really developed the in-house plant trials over the last two years um our guy bart is leading that up with help from Saeed, and that that's just been great to see that develop and um natalie also is helping with that more out in the field and then we also test for soil food web biology uh we test for pfos and we've actually been testing for that and publicly displaying our results long before that boston globe article came out about that compost in central mass uh who was composting paper sludge and like that's where they're getting pfos from so we're happy to say that food scrap compost don't contain a lot of pfos and uh we think we're good there so all these results are on our website and uh yeah so this is where the food scraps come from we pick them up from your house and this is the future in massachusetts like the states need to get the food scraps separated from the trash because otherwise this stuff would be going to an incinerator and that's a shame or put on a train to go into a landfill in ohio michigan or the carolinas or louisiana so that's a shame what a waste of energy effort all that so our motto is compost grow eat repeat go around round and around um and you guys are a big part of that and this is going to be mandated by the state so i'm really proud that our state like sees that vision um so we deliver in this area you know the half yard up to you know 40 yards or whatever and then we'll deliver outside this area it's just going to cost you more because it's a bit farther from our compost sites so we make compost a soil blend we're not calling it a premium soil blend because we've added some ingredients uh to just help it perform better in raised beds um bart and katie have been really uh instrumental in that those improvements we sell leaf mulch it's nice brown uh color and it feeds your soil we sell our bags we deliver them directly to your home you can also get them at our garden centers um and we also do raised beds and we have some new sizes we have like a small four by four which there's some photos of later that's like a really nice like affordable option um and then we deliver a compost for feeding your trees and we call it compost for yard health and it comes with instructions on how to feed your trees 
and we do this in June and in September. And the, the difference is, is that uh, we fine screen it, so it 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 goes on your lawn better. Because often, like your trees' feeder roots are under your lawn, so um, we it's we make it for your lawn. And then we also sell black soldier fly larva. And that's a whole other thing, but that's a big part of the future too, we believe. So we're just like dabbling at the moment. Uh, yep. So like I said, we deliver a half yard or up to 40 yards. And let's see if the video will play. Yeah. Oh, so here's our new conveyor truck. So we can kind of empty out any amount. The half yard is the minimum. And then we can deliver you bags or raise bed at the same time. And you can get our uh, compost or our soil blend in this. And you get half yard up to three or four yards in this. And so this is version one and we're building a version two right now. So keep an eye out for it. So it's a nice manageable quantity, the half yard. I'm really proud that we're able to like provide that. Oh. All right, hold on. I got it. There we go. All right, so I'm just trying to go over quickly the uh, some applications for compost. These are the ones. So for vegetable garden, um, so it's great for growing vegetables because it's made from vegetables. And like I was saying before, it's hard to grow vegetables from grass because grass doesn't contain all the nutrients that a vegetable needs. So it's as simple as that. Um, this is our friend Charlie Perlow from Beverly. He's a five. He's a two-time winner of the Friendly Garden Club of Beverly uh, contest. And then this is uh, Mac Park in Salem. And in the year of the pandemic, they, uh, the city of Salem tore up a baseball field, got three tractor trailers of our compost, and turned the baseball field into a farm. And then they grew fo food for the food pantry. So, you know, that's the kind of lifeboat that our compost sites are. It's like, if there's ever a food scare or shortage, well, you know what? We have everything you need to grow food. So um, that plus people knowledgeable in growing food. So, you know, that's a shout out to the farmers who are maintaining the knowledge of how to farm in our communities. And, you know, I, I think we can really do more to, uh, you know, provide access to like keep that farmer, um, institutional farmer knowledge experience people existing in the north shore because i'll tell you it's hard for them there's not a lot of land there's a lot of farmland a lot of 61a farmland but it, not a lot's in vegetable production uh so here's showing how you can um use our compost to seed a new lawn so they put the seed down they put the uh, compost on top. It looks like they went a little thick, maybe half inch or an inch. This might even be the soil blend. And you see this is in September and it came up. So that's what you can do. And so th that's starting from scratch and it works just the same starting, um, you know, if you have an existing lawn that's patchy. Um, but I'll, I'll caution, it's not, you're not always gonna have success. Like if you have a patchy lawn, the issue might be that where the patches are, it's like the soil is very compact. Um, so you either need to break that up and add compost and then seed, or you need to put a couple inches of soil blend down and then seed on top of that. So, you know, it it compost can't solve like, terrible problems already occurring um, or it could be too dry in a location. So 
this is kind of my my baby my project we call it compost for carbon drawdown we also call it um compost for your yard health but basically the concept is feeding your trees so most people think that like this is a common misconception that your tree's roots look like this under underground but they really don't they it looks more like this and all these little fine things these are all your feeder roots and that's where the tree is actually like absorbing nutrients and water and most of them are within the top 12 to 18 inches and they're coming up under here so in this picture the feeder roots are all under here and they're in competition with your grasses roots and that can be difficult for the trees because the, the grass kind of has an upper hand uh, in this situation. But the concept here is, so knowing where the feeder roots are, you want to apply compost where they are. So you don't want to do it right around the trunk because there's not really feeder roots there. And, you know, adding nutrients or fertilizer, any fertilizer here can like start to break down the wood. Um, also, you know, if you mulch too heavy here, then you're holding moisture and then these uh, larger trunk roots can like start to rot. So we give you instructions um, when you get this compost in the in June or September of where to apply it. So basically, if you look up at the tree, you can see the canopy, go to the edge of it, going straight down. You can make a donut around the tree. Um, and that's where you want to apply the compost. So in this picture, I actually took some orange straps and I laid them on the ground as a guide for myself. You know, I laid them under the, um, the canopy. You can see one trunk is here. The other trunk is over here. You can't really see it, but this is essentially where the drip line is. And then I put these piles of compost on either side and then I raked it out with the spring rake. And then it's going to look like this until you let rain in twice. So that's something I encourage you to, uh, you know, be aware of is that we send out this June and September compost for your yard health. And if anyone's interested, we actually have a fundraiser thing around that. We're like a group, like a climate action network or a school or a garden club. Um, you guys can earn money for yourselves or for another nonprofit or for students or for a scholarship. Like you just sign up people for this compost for carbon drawdown, and then we give a percent to that group. So, you know, if you get 100 people to get a half yard with instructions to feed their trees, not only are you, you know, making an effort towards carbon drawdown but you're also earning money for your organization. So uh, reach out to us if you're interested in you know, that fundraiser opportunity. Um, so here is, we're planting a tree. This is Connor Miller. He started the business Black Earth and he is here uh, benefiting from the, the fruits of our labor. He's planting a fruit tree and he's using compost to do it so you basically dig a hole bigger than you think and like this soil is good and you can see it's here in the hole so what you do is you take the compost you first you dump some in the hole just for good measure and then you take more of it and you blend it with the soil about 50 50 and that's going to be the kind of material the soil you put around the tree so put the tree in the hole and then take your blend and put it around um don't pack it in anytime you're filling a raised bed or planting like do not pack in the soil or anything like remember the plants roots breathe oxygen and like when you pack it in you're you're closing the air spaces that the tree's roots are expected so it's all about keeping it loose, like not too loose. You want to fill in all the voids, you know, and especially under the tree. But you, you're not, you, yeah, you're not packing it in. Um, 
Cool. And then for raised beds, so topping off uh, every year is a good idea. So we say, you know, two to four bags for a four by eight raised bed. And you can also get a half yard of compost and use, you know, a portion of it on your beds. And ideally, you, you would mix the compost in to the top like two or three inches. Um, but if you have like perennials plant in there, then you would just kind of top dress the compost around it. Um, yeah. And yep, so this is our new soil blend that we put together. So our, our soil blend was originally sandy loam and black earth compost. We use a sandy loam because like it is actually soil and like that's what you're growing in. Like over time, the compost gets eaten away and releases its nutrients. But, and like what remains is your soil. So that's why we like have that base. Like a lot, like a potting soil is actually just all organic matter. And usually it's like mostly peat with some fertilizer in it. And, you know, organic matter just keeps breaking down over time. And so then, you know, it can get mushy. You lose your like pore spaces for breathing. So potting soil isn't going to perform over 10 years. But a sandy loam is going to perform over 10 years. You just got to amend it you know, add new nutrients, just like a farmer would. So we provide a uh, real soil because we want it to last forever. Like we don't want to like keep turning it over. Um, and you just kind of add your amendments, you know, add some compost, but also add, like we recommend using like a nitrogen fertilizer because uh, like compost isn't going to provide all the nitrogen you need um for like heavy feeders like most vegetables so we like uh ne neptune's harvest or like some granular organic uh fertilizer so in our soil blend compost sandy loam and then we've added a wood fiber that is gonna hold on, help hold on to moisture We've added rice hulls, which helps keep pore spaces open. And I don't know um, if you've seen like in the past, we've had clumpy soil and like that's hard to deal with. And it's a result of kind of like mixing compost in early spring. Everyone wants their soil, but we're like outside mixing the soil in the elements and that can lead to clumps. So the rice hulls have helped with that. And finally, we added a organically certified fertilizer because lo and behold, the rice hulls and the wood fiber have some nitrogen draw. So we add a little nitrogen in there only in our soil blend. So it like helps you get through that initial um, phase. But at the end of the day, through your season, you want to be watching your plants and, you know, kind of noticing if they need uh additional fertilizer or not but i think you should be good with what this premium soil blend has so um yeah that that's been exciting so this we've done trials on it and this will be our first year releasing it and next year we'll probably you know have some improvement either the ratios between the things um or who knows like i don't want to keep adding more new more ingredients i think each ingredient kind of adds a particular thing. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, basically we do plant trials and the plants tell us what works and what doesn't and that's how we follow them. That That's like our guide. And the, the wood fiber, I'm excited to add because this year, you know, we're flipping into a La Nina at some point, either early summer or late summer, but I think it's gonna be a droughty, summer unlike last year so i think the wood fiber especially in raised beds is going to help hold on to moisture and our leaf mulch so you know it's not a wood mulch it's a leaf mulch so it's going to feed your soil so apply about two inches 
And um, one thing to keep in mind with mulch is when, so yes, it holds moisture in, but you actually need to water. So you don't have to water as much, but when you do water, you have to water more because you gotta remember, not only are you, do you have to wet the mulch, but you all, you're actually trying to wet the soil underneath. So one way around that is you can actually put your hose kind of under the mulch and then let the water kind of spread out. Um, but at the end of the day, when you think you're done watering, you want to pull the mulch back and you want to dig your hand in a couple inches and see if it's moist. And that's your guide of whether you watered enough. Nothing else is really sufficient to tell you if you watered enough. Um, like, just looking at the surface is not going to tell you what's going on uh, down below. And here's our raised beds. So we have the 4 by 12 the 4 by 8 and the 4 by 4 And this actually isn't... Um, so this 4 by 4 we actually sell them... This looks like a custom one that someone wanted the full height, but the four by four we sell standards is actually only two boards high. So it's a nice low garden um, and it's it's uh, more affordable than these larger ones. Uh, you know, you can grow more in these, but this is a nice way to start or like put it in a corner at your house. We also have a three by six and a uh, two by four. So it'd be like this one, but half the size. So we have different options and, you know, just let us know what you're interested in. But um, one thing I'll say about our raised beds is you can price it out against what you can buy as far as lumber at the hardware store or Home Depot, but our bed is gonna be cheaper. And that's because we buy our wood on a full tractor trailer each year. So we get a really good price on the wood. And then we're really efficient on assembling these beds. And we do a good job at them. Like you can see these fasteners here. Like these are made for longevity. Because a lot of times when people make raised beds, they just put a screw in here and like, the death of the bed is not the wood rotting out. The death of a bed is the fasteners pulling out. So that's why we use these four by fours in the corner and we use these large head uh, screws that hold the thing together. So if you want a raised bed, you might as well just get it from us because you can't do any better on your own um, unless you're getting your wood for free or something. But anyways, it comes as a kit. Uh, with instructions on how to install it or how to construct it. And yeah, all you need is a, a screw gun. We, we give you the bit for the screws. Um, and so a couple final things. So compost carpool, that's just a way to help you save. Like if you order compost from us, we give you a code at the end of it and you can talk to your neighbor and or anyone in your town that could be across town and you give them the code and then they order with that code and then it cuts your delivery fee in half. Um, <clears throat> and then this is just talking about the fine screen compost. So it's in June and September. Fine screen compost, compost for yard health, compost for carbon drawdown. We haven't really settled on a name in the last four years, but it's all the same. It's a fine screen compost that's made for feeding trees or your lawn. And then these are all the farms that, that we work with, either through our FarmWorks program um, or that buy compost from us. And <clears throat> so something new we're doing is uh, we're collecting your hard to recycle materials. So. And no, we're not putting them in your compost pile. Uh, like a lot of you probably know that we already collect textiles, but we're also, um, <laughs> I love this stuffed animal here. We also uh, are going to be collecting um, donations. 
we'll be collecting textiles still through this program, electronics, and a whole list of other stuff like K cups, um, plastic film wrap, so plastic bags and the like. And we come either monthly or quarterly. That's that's up to you, and it depends on what town you're in. But um, this is really exciting. It's a great way to just get more out of the trash stream and get to a better place. Like especially the donation stuff. Like <clears throat> um, a lot of people don't like using Craigslist or Facebook, so they don't really have a great option, and so they just put stuff in the trash. So this is a great, we're trying to make a pathway for stuff to like have a second life. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's about. We're a resource company. We don't want to mine new resources to make all the crap that we have. It'd be better just to reuse what we have or recover the, you know, elements and metals, et cetera, from the stuff we can't use anymore to make new crap um, and textiles. So the way that works is we take them in, we give them to a company, they grade them. Like they'll either sell them domestically, sell them internationally, or the stuff that is not like worth reselling, they shred it and it becomes like, like a fiber, which is used in all kinds of, um, applications whether it's like insulation in your car um <clears throat> yeah insulation i think usually they do and then this stuff gets donated for reuse so uh we're getting near the end of the presentation this is our new facility in manchester mass um some of you may have donated towards this and that was really helpful at the time because we were scared to even embark on this project because it was a massive undertaking and we are almost done we started at the end of 2022 and we are almost done national grid finally got themselves together and i think they're going to get us a transformer in a week and a half and there'll be another six weeks for them to hook it up so we're almost there but basically, this is an indoor compost facility. Your food scraps come in here. The leaves and sticks come in here. We compost it inside, under cover, away from birds for three to six weeks, away from storm events, which are really unpredictable now. Like we've gotten an inch of rain, it seems like every week for the last 10 months. So this like insulates us from that situation. And the concept here is inside the building, you get your pathogen kill, you get your jumping worm kill, you get your weed seed kill, you get your volume reduction, your liquids management, you get through the odorous stage and you dry the compost. And when it comes out the back, it's either ready to go straight onto a farm or we um, bring it up this landfill and we cure it at the top and um, finish it for home gardeners like gardeners need a more cured product to not burn plants and <clears throat> this is kind of our vision for the future in massachusetts every 10 towns should have a facility a compost facility when you're closer to neighbors within 128 you get something like this when you're outside 128 you get something um it doesn't need to be as this intense but that's the vision we're building we have a site so this is our site in manchester mass we have something kind of like version one of this in groton i was there this morning and then we have another site in framingham so and we're looking to make more sites over the state and just in rhode island and massachusetts and you know just further our mission of recovering the food scraps and putting them to their best use so that's it um i'm gonna leave the screen share because actually i told you guys that i would take questions but i couldn't see any questions while i was doing that um so yeah
All right. Well, we got a lot of questions in the chat. Um, does anyone want to raise their hand and ask a question? Maybe we can start with some, you know, audience participation. All right, Kathy, you, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so I'm on the board of selectmen, and I already wrote a long question, so I'll just shorten it to a short one. Um, so I'm also heading up a task force. We want to rethink our trash contract. Um, we used to allow four barrels <laughs> prior to this contract of trash. Um, and then we restricted it to two barrels in the new contract, but um, folks aren't really doing well with following that. So we're trying to re-educate and kind of change the outlook. We'd like to include some type of composting option um, as part of the rollout of a new contract, which is like a year and a half from now. So okay. is that in that towns do that they offer that option as part of the rollout of a new contract? It is, um, but it is an extra cost for the town to pay for it. Are, are, are you a town with a huge excess budget? <laughs> no, um, but, but, but we're thinking to go to a pay as you throw so everybody has to buy the bags. Yep. We Currently, just have overflow. So, if they, what we're, what we're going to try and sell them on is an avoided cost kind of thing. We're not going to lower the tax rate, but we're going to start a separate fund, probably a revolving fund for the um, sale of the bags. And you're going to have to buy the bags. Yep. And we're yes. going, yeah, we'll provide the carts. We can fund that probably um, within the contract. But cool. um, we don't have a lot of extra money, but we can. I think we can maneuver funds. So I, yeah, that was a little joke, but like yeah. <laughs> most towns, what they do is they work with black earth to set up a private pay program. And okay. you could either like, there's a number of mechanisms where the town can actually promote the program. And we actually see those as like the most successful, okay. like, yeah. Um, you can look at Beverly or Salem or Newton, like yeah. the yeah, the mayor of Newton, like yeah. uh, promoted our program and they got like a thousand signups within a couple weeks. And so that's all private pay direct with us. And yeah. so it's a nice way for the residential customer, like has like some skin in the game, which actually helps them like do better we think and it doesn't become a big um extra cost you know up okay. front we only have a couple towns that actually do uh the municipal wide <laughs> service but there's other things you can do too like in like the town can lower like a person's water bill that's a way that if they're in the compost program oh. that's a uh kind of okay. subsidy mechanism that was creative the town can also pay for the bins to help like residents get started, but then they still do the private program. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd encourage you to reach out to us and we can, um, you know, okay. work with you to figure out what works for your town. Okay. Hey, another Andrew, can I say a word? Well, oh, here's okay. Connor. Hi. Um, <laughs> hi. Um, if, if it was pay as you throw every yeah. other week, Composting collection would save a town money, but every every trash it's it's like every trash every household in a town has trash pickup, so they have a density of like nearly a hundred percent, right? But composting, what do you maybe mean? Maybe half the town will do it. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm not it, sure what what we get initially. You know, we rolled out recycling down in our town hall 25 years ago, and it was a it was popular and now it's just kind of faded off into nothingness. Yeah, so we're we're approaching it as a re-education thing um, and selling it in like an avoided cost because we can't keep this trash contract completely within our budget without cutting other department budgets, cutting council on aging services, cutting library services. We just can't keep up with the Cost. It's going up way too fast. Yeah, and it's going to keep going up because the landfills are all closing by 2030. 
And so, yeah. like, in se in like seven years, if you if you could get trash to every other week and have weekly compost, because composting pricing is not going up, not like that at least. You're going to save money with composting. It's just a question of getting the same amount of density. If we could have the same density as trash today. I get um, what you're saying. I didn't understand what you were saying at first. If we have this, yeah, if we have the same <laughs> number of households. I get you. But we're doing like a third of, you know, or a quarter. If we have the same number, we would be cheaper than trash today. But if, if we had, if you have to do all of them, it would be an added cost unless you push trash to every other week. But if you take all the food, which is half the weight, out of the trash every other week isn't a problem. It's just yeah. going to be kind of a slow adoption curve kind of thing. <laughs> yep. Didn't Hamilton go every other week? Did they make yeah. they went to it? Yeah. I, I don't know how long that lasts or if it's still going that way or not. I haven't heard. Yeah. And it, it's important to keep in mind that, like, the Mass Massachusetts DEP, who regulates the waste bans, like, they they understand that the trash crisis is coming, and they're dropping the threshold for food waste so, to where they're gonna force all municipalities to offer the service town wide. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so it's yeah. important to like get your program started now, um, and like. Otherwise, if you wait until you're forced to do it with the waistband, then you're going to be one of many towns calling around looking for a new service, and it's going to be expensive. Yeah, and, and this kind of thing takes years and years to you know go from zero to fifty percent participation. It's going to be like six or seven years. So, okay, um, what I don't know a lot about the composting, so it's been educational for me, but. I know that we allow like um, yard waste to be dropped at our highway site. And I just kind of assumed that it somehow was composting, but from, from what you've described in, in, in detail tonight, there's no way it's being, what is it, what's happening to it, do you think? I mean, it, it all depends. Some towns, like I'd say very few towns actually like form it into windrows, turn the windrows on a regular basis, take temperatures, ensure oh, no. they get pathogen kill. <laughs> Most oh. towns are yeah. just stockpiling, pushing up. Yes. And then when it's full enough, they pay to have it trucked out. Oh. But that's, that's where we can come in. Like we can actually run your site, incorporate food scraps responsibly, and then we that's actually the lowest cost way to get the collection service. So like the town of Manchester uh, we're working with, they're one of the few that pays for it town wide. And the reason is, is because we work with them and because we're bringing the food scraps in town, it's very low cost because there's low costs on our end. So we don't have to charge the town a lot. Right, but you said you don't want like yard clippings for compost. So I'm just kind of wondering. We do. Yep. Yep. Leaves and sticks are what we make our compost out of. We keep the grass out. Well, so in Manchester, we compost the grass separately. Okay. So, so what we're doing with them, just piling it down in the highway department, is not really composting. <laughs> Most yeah. Like okay. I understand better. That's yep. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. It was very helpful. Cool. <laughs> yep. Um, well, there's a question here um, kind of along the lines about what happens to food waste picked up by the city of Boston. Um, so that either goes to the core, which is waste management's depackager, and that goes to an anaerobic digester up at the Lawrence Wastewater Treatment Plant, or it goes down to the compost yard in Brockton um, that Save That Stuff has. I'm not sure like what how they partition it between the two. Um, how many bags are in a half yard? Uh, it's so a half cubic yard, a full cubic yard is 27 uh, cubic feet. So 
Each of our badges is one cubic foot, so the answer is 13. Um, so someone who just has pots and planters, what's the best combination of soil and compost? So if you can get a half yard of our soil blend, that would be a good option because it has um, the rice hulls, the wood fiber, the fertilizer, the compost, the soil. That would be a good combination. But if you just have compost, you could blend it 50-50 with, um, with, uh, with like loam from your yard, for example, or old potting soil. Like our compost is basically you can reinvigorate something from last year. So if you dumped all your pine soil in a pile last year, grab some of that, mix some of our compost in, and uh, put it in your pot. Um, someone asked if we should be discouraged from planting grass lawns. Um, some people like lawns. Um, I think more important is we should be encouraged to planting trees and keeping them healthy. So, you know, we do a webinar in the fall about, you know, keeping your trees healthy and feeding them. But I think that's what we should be encouraging is more trees because trees keep our neighborhoods cool, which reduces the air conditioning load needed in the summer. It keeps your car cool. It just makes a nice space, you know. It, so great example, everyone's afraid of, you know, cutting down, they're cutting down trees because they're afraid of them falling on your house. That may be true, but like have you considered that the tree might be sick because we've kind of been abusing them for a long time um you know by taking their leaves away every year so we're trying to argue that you should be feeding your trees and keeping them healthy and you know plant new trees uh how long is compost good for um yeah it's definitely good for the fall so or into the fall and it's good indefinitely um, it just keeps breaking down. It keeps getting finer and finer. Um, I, I have some of our first compost batch ever, batch one, and it's in a plastic bag upstairs and it's, uh, it's like really fine now. It's incredible that it keeps breaking down. Uh, can the delivery truck back into a narrow driveway between two houses? Eight foot wide, that's... So our truck's like eight and a half feet wide, but you have the mirrors on either side too. So it could be 12. Uh, what kind of wood do we use for the raised beds? Uh, it's spruce pine fir, it's nothing special. If it was cedar, it would be way too expensive. And like I was saying, the death of a bed is not really the wood rotting out, it's the fasteners pulling out. So we've seen the um, spruce pine fir last, uh, I think our oldest bed is seven years now. Um, yes, we have interest in biochar and a biochar company came to us and they offered us a whole tractor trailer of biochar. So we're gonna be doing some trials with it this year. Um, shredded paper should, so someone said that they recently read shredded paper should not be recycled. So yes, I don't think that should be because I think it just ends up in the trash. Like they say in recycling that anything less than two inches in any dimension just ends up in the trash. And it so shredded paper falls in that category. Um, <clears throat> should it be composted? I'd say, I think newspaper's fine because it has like soy inks, but anything else, I'd just be careful of um, the inks and like, if it's glossy or laminated, definitely not. Um, and then I think, yeah, does anyone have any other questions? All right, well, thanks for coming out.